Hej och välkomna till Juda Ting, en podcast om sällsamma historier, kreativitet och kreatörerna själva. Mitt namn är Henrik Möller, musiken är skapad av testbild och loggan till podden är gjord av Malmökonstnären Nalecinski. Dagens avsnitt är byggt runt vår gäst Kenneth George Goodwin från Kanada. Han var den första att skriva en seriös artikel om David Lynch Eraserhead och blev Lynch favoritförfattare på ämnet. Senare skulle han följa med Lynch ner till Mexiko för den katastrofala mastodontinspelningen av Frank Herberts Dune. Eraserhead, om man inte har sett den förut, är en film som man kanske bör se ensam sent på kvällen, helt utan distraktioner och bara sjunka in i det svartvita noirfotot och stämningen med en fantastisk ljudbild. Första gången som jag såg Eraserhead, det blev en sån där livsomvälvande upplevelse. Besattheten av världen och mysteriet som Lynch hade skapat, men också att han jobbade på filmen i fem år där han byggde kulisserna och skapade alla specialeffekterna själv. Han till och med bodde periodvis i kulisserna under inspelningen. Han sjönk in i den världen till hundra procent och stängde ut omvärlden tills hans äktenskap tog slut och hans föräldrar konfronterade honom med vad fan det var han höll på med egentligen. Lynch var ju knäckt, men han jobbade ihop de sista pengarna och avslutade filmen ett och ett halvt år senare. Filmen släpptes någon gång mellan 1976 och 79 och kritikerna var absolut inte redo för den här mörka, intensiva fantasivärlden som Lynch hade skapat. Men en av de som älskade filmen när den kom ut är dagens gäst, Kenneth George Goodwin. When did you first see Eraserhead and start your scholarly work on it? Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't actually call it scholarly. I, I sort of began as a fan. Um, I first saw Eraserhead in uh, 1980, and uh, I saw it about eight times over that summer and uh, was quite obsessed with it. A friend and I used to uh, go to midnight screenings and then we'd uh, walk around for the rest of the night just talking about it. And uh, I just I just couldn't shake it off. So uh, eventually I decided to just write down what I thought was uh, going on in the film and, and how it affected me. And that was my original uh, sort of critical essay on the film. And uh, I sent that to a magazine that I subscribed to called Cine Fantastique. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, yes, that's one of my favorite magazines of all time. Uh, uh, it, yeah, it was one of my favorite magazines back then. Uh, but I sent it to uh, Frederick Clark at Cine Fantastique. And uh, he wrote back and told me that uh, it wasn't the kind of thing they usually published because it was it sort of had a slightly academic tone to it. Um, but he had been trying to do something about Eraserhead for several years, and he uh, had, without talking to me, sent my essay directly to David Lynch to convince him that the magazine took his work seriously and wasn't, uh, you know, that they they wanted to do something very positive about the film, and he agreed to. Uh, to do an article about the making of the film, but he told the magazine that it had to be me writing it, even though I'd never I'd never done any sort of journalistic writing or anything uh, in the past. And uh, there was a little bit of back and forth about that. And eventually I went to Los Angeles for a week in December of 1981, and I interviewed Lynch. We had two complete art afternoons together and I talked to Jack Nance and Fred Elms and uh, a whole bunch of other people who were involved in the film. And uh, then over that winter, uh, after transcribing all the interviews, I, I wrote the article which uh, uh, Cine Fantastic eventually published. And so that gave me a connection to David Lynch. I'd, I'd met him, we got along well, he really liked what I'd written about the film. I've read your quotes from Lynch saying that your review was the closest to his intentions with Eraserhead. What do you think he liked about your take on it? You know, um, he doesn't like to talk about the sort of meanings of his work at all. And so he wasn't, we didn't actually discuss my analysis other than that uh, he told me, yeah, that stuff is in there, but that's just part of it. So it our conversation was much more 
sort of anecdotal about the actual years long process of making the film and and uh, the difficulties that were involved and uh, overcoming certain technical things you know when they ran out of money and uh, he thought he wasn't going to be able to finish it and then you know he managed to scrape together some money after a year and you know sort of got back to doing it it was it was more of a, a narrative about making the film than it was about what's in the film or what was behind what he was putting in the film you know i i i did prod a few times uh, at certain things but uh you know as soon as he showed some resistance because i didn't want to alienate him of course um i would back off and move on to something else because you know once once i i brought up a particular thing uh, he would just start talking and then uh, i would stick in a comment or or prod him with another question just to keep it flowing but it was mostly you know he was ready to talk about it because he'd, he'd never actually spoken at that point in any detail about the film and the making of the film so i was lucky enough to be the the first person that he decided to tell those stories too i asked kenneth to summarize his interpretation from his eraserhead text and he sent me this recording in which he does the sound is a bit low what i first saw in eraserhead was a deep horror of reproduction which permeates henry's world with an intense anxiety about sex which in turn produces a kind of death wish the lady in the radiator represents a place devoid of sex a sterile other realm which for Henry is heaven. So it's kind of a vaguely Freudian interpretation. Of course, there's a lot more going on in the film than just that, but that was uh, sort of the central thematic thread that I followed when I uh, first wrote about the film. Well, my take on Eraserhead, especially after hearing that Lynch got inspiration from a line in the Bible, but anyway, it seems pretty religious, the man in the planet being this crazy godlike creature controlling the sperms and creation of life with his levers, and the girl in the radiator being obviously death, crushing the sperms and singing invitingly to Henry, in heaven everything is fine. In heaven. does say that it's his most spiritual film but he's never said what line in the bible set it off you know he's kept that to himself but interestingly through my interpretation the lady in the radiator is also a symbol of death so so i arrived at that from a wholly different uh, angle from what uh, from what you just said so you know i i think that there are probably a lot of ways you can get into the film or, or approach it, but uh, whatever way you get into it, I think certain elements of the film will will represent similar things, despite your different perspective. But had the Elephant Man come out at this point? Yeah, Elephant Man had come out uh, before I I actually talked to Lynch. You know, the people within the filmmaking community. Uh, there were people who had responded very positively to the film because they recognized just on sheer level of craft that you know he was very talented and that included mel brooks and jonathan sanger and uh, stuart kornfeld who produced uh, elephant man because he sort of brought the um the aesthetic sensibility of eraserhead into a more mainstream movie i mean you know that could have been story could have been done you know in a sort of hollywood way but he brought that uh, you know his his use of sound and and his weird uh, sort of design sensibility to elephant man so it sort of briefly crossed over into a commercial realm but uh, interesting i just finished reading lynch's uh, autobiography and uh, it's interesting to note that a lot of people who worked on Elephant Man asked to have their names taken off it because they thought it was such a terrible film. <laughs>
because you know a, a, a lot of the English crew were you know sort of mainstream craftspeople, and what he was doing didn't seem good to them because it was uh, it was this weird idiosyncratic approach. So the all the nominations that he got for Elephant Man, I think, came as a bit of a surprise. But what surprised me was the amount of directors in Hollywood that were impressed by Eraser at this strange artsy film. I mean, I liked it, but I've read that even Stanley Kubrick was a fan and he spent some time trying to figure out how the baby was constructed. Yes, <laughs> I heard that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean everybody still want everybody still wonders how how he did that because uh, it's it's a very disturbing uh, creation and it's it is quite hard to, to to figure out what the mechanics of it might have been it looks very much like a lamp fetus and lynch is known for using organic material in his work yeah that was that was one of the uh, the speculations at the time that it was a it was an actual uh, I, I assume people thought that he had taken the fetus and sort of fitted an armature in it to make it uh, move. But uh, yeah, it's still it's still a, a very well kept secret. But did you feel you were onto something when Lynch asked you to move remove specific observations that you had about the film? Well, the things he changed were were very minor. It, it would just be a comment which he thought might. Um, suggest something about the baby, but it wasn't like a specific detail. So he just didn't want people to start thinking in a certain sort of direction. So they they, they were very small changes, and I, I you know they didn't really uh, affect the article that I wrote in any in any substantial way. Speaking of analysis, there's a fairly new book on Eraserhead by a John Fairhurst called The Key to Eraserhead. It's a scholarly essay in the form of a comic book. Well, you know, I, I've actually, I have read that. In fact, he got in touch with me when he was uh, publishing it and uh, we we communicated a little bit back and forth. Um, it's It's an interesting work, but I don't actually by his argument. Um, I, I assume you haven't read it yet. No, I haven't. Yeah, because it, I mean, and it's always problematic when somebody you know finds the key to something and then and then applies that to every. Uh, because for him, it's uh, it's Lynch's version of a Shakespeare play, and he finds in images and lines throughout the film direct references to a particular Shakespeare text and uh, I I mean I, I'm sure you could probably find those kind of um, connections to any number of other works but he happened to notice this particular connection but you know Lynch has never as far as I know Lynch has never really talked about Shakespeare I don't know if he's ever had any particular interest in Shakespeare so to to turn that around to you know this thing that he spent four years making was rooted directly in one Shakespeare play <laughs> seems a bit of a stretch to me but it isn't it's an interesting the, the graphic novel is is an interesting work but uh, I don't actually buy the argument Speaking of books, I've read that he was a huge Kafka fan and he wanted to make Metamorphosis for many years. At another time, he said that if Kafka ever wrote a crime story, he would be there to direct it immediately. But when I interviewed Lynch, I asked him if he had any favorite novel and he said no, he was, that he didn't read books and he seemed to have changed his mind. When when I interviewed him, there was we, we did talk a bit about... Um, like cinematic influences, but even there, he uh, he sort of denied that he was a big film goer. Um, like he liked some Bergman and uh, he liked Tati. He didn't really seem to feel that what he was doing uh, grew out of those kind of influences. Like the Eraser had grew more out of his his art practice and his own personal experiences. I mean, you know, he talks at length about uh, what a nightmare Philadelphia was when he lived there, and that uh, Eraserhead reflects 
his experience of living in that city, which apparently in the, the late 60s was a pretty grim place to live. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell with him where, where things come from because he has this, well, again, he doesn't like to talk too much in detail about his work. But, you know, through, uh, particularly since he got into meditation and so on, he mostly talks about how he just lets things bubble up and flow through him. And then he starts sort of putting them together. And, you know, he'll have an idea one time that just sort of sits there. But then another idea comes up later and they go together and he sort of builds on that, which is, you know, that's how he made Inland Empire was sort of piece by piece to sort of letting it grow organically over several years. And uh, I mean, he, he sort of freely says he, he's not entirely sure what the meaning of everything he does is because that doesn't concern him. For him, it's the, it's the act of creating and then what comes out of that act uh, is what it is. And you, know, you, can, you can interpret it how you want, he'll interpret it how he wants. But the thing itself exists sort of outside of him. When I interviewed Lynch in 2010, I asked him about the use of names in his films. Do you have uh, uh, different personalities connected to different names? I know you like Sally and Bob and Henry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A name is very important. I don't know 100% how it works, but if you did change your name, uh, I think you change your life in some ways, maybe profound ways. There's a lot in a name. People are given a name and they, those names um, define a way of being, I believe. If I don't know which comes first, the way of being and then they get the name, or the name and then the way of being. But a name is very important. And I would say Sally will do certain things that Rebecca would not do, and vice versa. And we started to talk about the name Henry, which is the name of the protagonist in Eraserhead. Henry is an interesting name. Uh, Henry is a thinker. Henry is not a macho name, like Buck. Uh, even Billy is more macho than Henry. Henry is more of an intellectual, a thinker. Henry is wondering about things. Henry is very observant. Henry understands fear and uh, caution, but is, is a, a, a good soul, a, a good soul, but always on the lookout for the mysteries, the answers to the mysteries. So, from this Eraserhead article, how did you come to start documenting Lynch's Dune, the most expensive film production of its time? It was totally uh, uh, fortuitous. Um, you know, I had I had written the article. I sent a copy to Lynch before I sent it to the magazine because I had I had promised him that I wouldn't put in anything which he didn't want, which I know is not good journalism, but you know, I wasn't a journalist, and uh, I wanted to honor like him and his, you know, his uh, feelings. Uh, he liked the article, and uh, it was actually my sister at the time who said, "Well, why don't you just ask him for a job?" <laughs> which, which I thought was utterly ridiculous, but uh, I thought about it for a few days, and then I sent him a letter, and I said, uh, "You know, we've met, we got along. You like." Uh, you, you know, you like the work that I've done. Um, is there any chance that there'd be something I could do on Dune? And um, he didn't. He didn't sort of laugh that off. In fact, over uh, the rest of that year, um, I think there were two times when something looked like it might. Uh, work out, but they both fell through, and I can't remember now what those jobs were. But then um, uh, one of the uh, people in the publicity department at Universal Studios had decided to uh, to try something new, and instead of you know just sort of sending a, a video crew once or twice during the production to grab a little on-set action and a, a couple of interview clips, 
he decided it would be a good idea to have a documentary crew on the entire production for six months uh, to, to shoot everything that's going on behind the scenes, on the scene, on the set, uh, do interviews with cast and crew and so on. And Lynch, who of course was, was embarking on something which was a monumental project that was utterly beyond anything he'd done before, uh, was, you know, he was kind of nervous. And he told them that, um, you know, if you're going to stick a video crew on my set, you have to give me people that I trust. And uh, they said, okay, that's fine with us. And he said, well, there's a cameraman in San Francisco, the, which is Anatole Patsonowski, who uh, he had known from the American Film Institute, and this writer from Canada. And Universal said, okay. So I had no qualifications. I had no experience. And I didn't, I didn't even have to have an interview. They just sent me a ticket and flew me to Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, we put together the equipment package, went down to Mexico, and we were there for six months shooting uh, stuff around Turbusco Studios, uh, Mexico City, and uh, up around Juarez where, you know, we shot in the desert for a week. So it was, you know, it, it was almost like a fantasy experience. I, uh, I, you know, um, unfortunately for me, I, I didn't manage to uh, turn that into a... Uh, like a, a sort of a major career launch pad. <laughs> the documentary never got made. We we shot, I think it was a 75 hours of videotape. And at the end of six months, the people at Universal said, pack it all up and send it back to Los Angeles and goodbye. Because originally, uh, Anatole and I were supposed to go back to Los Angeles with the material and work on the making of, uh, you know, like a one hour making of. And um, but we didn't have the contract for that. And at the end of six months, they basically just told us to get lost and took the material away. And uh, you know that material has disappeared. But there was a documentary made for on-set footage. I've seen it. Yeah, that was made by Paul Salmon, and it was made specifically to show at. Uh, like Comic Con and you know fan conventions and so on to sort of pump up some interest in the film. It was our material. Yeah, he uh, took a bunch of our tapes. Uh, they had an editing uh, an editing room elsewhere in uh, at Churubusco Studios, so he took a bunch of our tapes and worked with an editor there to put that together. But that is really the only thing that exists out of that seventy five hours of material. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have fantasized over the years, uh, I couldn't even tell you how many times, of being able to make a sort of Hearts of Darkness documentary about the making of Dune, uh, using that material and, you know, sort of uh, modern uh, interviews with people involved and so on. Kenneth has a part from his book on a race thread, which I highly recommend. He's written a book about his time on the set of Dune. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, my book on Dune is not is not really about the making of Dune. It was I kept a diary while I was down there, so it's more it's more about me than it is about the film. Which, uh, but it does contain the uh, uh, a number of interviews that uh, I did salvage from our documentary project. At what point in the production of Dune did you come and meet and interview him? He was he had just finished working with uh, Christopher and Eric Berggren, the the guys who wrote the Elephant Man, and they had just delivered a two part script to Universal and uh, De Laurentiis, which would have been you know like two two hour movies, which nowadays of course you know everybody's doing that, but. Back then, that was unheard of. No, you can't make this one story in two parts. So um, he was about to embark on doing another um, uh, draft of the script, but by himself, like uh, Christopher and Eric Bergen had left the project. And so he was going to take those two parts and sort of crush them down into one script, which was eventually the shooting script. And so he was, at that time, very, very deeply involved in um, 
conceiving of the film's various worlds and uh, and all those you know all those elements as you as you mentioned the you know the whole religious thing that's running through it <coughs> and um, but we didn't talk in detail about the meanings of that I mean you know there was something there was some about the the sort of ecological aspects and about the um, uh, the relationship between um, religion and the uh, you know the the warlike forces that were coming into play in the book uh, the fremen have something like an islamic presence <clears throat> you know it's very hard it's, it grows out of the desert and and i mean they even use the word jihad in in the book and the film it's a holy war that they're waging Against these uh, interloping cultures who are coming to their planet to uh, to harvest the spice, so we talked a little bit about that, but not a lot. I think he was at that point really, really um, deeply involved in logistical questions about how to make the story uh, manageable in the amount of time he was going to have. Lynch always said he didn't care for science fiction, but it seems like the perfect project for Lynch with all of its esoteric, religious and metaphysical ideas. What do you think attracted Lynch to the project? What interested him was uh, was the building these four different worlds, each with its own visual, uh, you know, aesthetic, um, its its own cultural elements, and I think you can tell from just watching the movie that the one that appealed to him most was the Harkonnens where he where he just reveled in the you know his his whole biological thing you know, sort of body horror and and all, and all those sort of elements and and you could see on set just how much he enjoyed working with you know the scene where the the Baron is ranting while the doctor pokes his boils and things like, you know, Lynch loved that kind of stuff. I, of course, there's the famous thing where uh, um, Lynch was with uh, De Laurentiis in Italy and they visited Venice and that gave him the inspiration for a lot of the uh, the sort of architectural design in the film you know which is why you get the you know the the great hall on Arrakis with all its uh, murals and mosaics and thing that that is sort of directly drawn from uh, you know what he saw in Venice the original concept artist for Jodorowsky's version of Dune, the, the Harkonnens for the Harkonnen planet and also for Ridley Scott's version of the Harkonnen Ridley Scott was also attached to the project after Jodorowsky's Dune. He abandoned this project when his brother Frank died and he had to do a quicker project, which ironically turned out to be Blade Runner. Well, anyway, the concept artist for the Harkonnen planet was H.R. Giger, the creator of Alien. And Lynch never used him. Giger said he always wanted to work for Lynch, but he never knew why Lynch avoided him. I I can see where there, there there's the potential for for real friction with two artists that uh, idiosyncratic and, and and intense, but also with a, a a certain similarity. Although I mean they're they're quite different, but there's that you know the whole biomechanical thing in Giger and and Lynch's uh, sort of distorted bodies and so on. So I could see where he might. Uh, shy away from having somebody like Giger come in to, uh, to work on his version of the film. Do you remember any interesting on-set things under Lynch's direction? There were some very strange things, which of course were, were very Lynchian. Um, they, they needed uh, a shot of um, when, when Paul is studying about Arrakis and he's looking at the, uh, the you know, sort of video text that he's... Uh, that he's got. There's supposed to be an, an image of a cross section of a sandworm. So, you know, as if somebody had sliced through it and you see the organs and so on. And instead of getting somebody to, uh, to construct something like that, Lynch got the idea of why don't we get a cow and cut it in half and then shoot 
the growth section of the cow. So there was uh, there was a day when they actually had a frozen cow on one of the sets, and uh, they they got somebody in to try and cut through it, but it was uh, it was frozen. So you know they 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 were like going at it with an axe and a chainsaw, and of course just making a huge mess and making the set really really stinky and of course it didn't work because you know that might seem like something uh conceptually that might seem like a good idea but for you know for a film image um it would be much better to construct that that item uh out of pieces that you could control rather than rather than uh, you know try to get something that was authentically natural like that and uh and I, I think the 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 residue of that idea came in this scene um when uh, sting comes out of the shower there's a shot of uh raban walking down a corridor and there's a cow carcass hanging from the ceiling with a, a couple of dwarfs poking it with cattle prods or something and raban rips the tongue out and chews on it as he goes into the shower room uh that's very lynchian uh and it was it was pretty gross to see. <laughs> oh there uh, go back to that scene in the shower room and you can see when the baron is getting really excited and he uh he squeezes raban's face with his hand and raban's got these bits of meat sort of falling out of his mouth that's the cow tongue <laughs> It was, it was pretty disgusting, and, and I think it was pretty disgusting for Paul Smith because the cow's tongue had been around for a while by the, by the time he got to chew on it. Did you observe any of the classic hands-on effects usually done by Lynch in all of his films? No, there wasn't, there wasn't a huge amount of time for him to be that personal with the details. So, you know, everything needed to be pretty much prepared by the time he got to the set to shoot. I do remember one uh, one tense moment where um, the uh, the cable car that Piter sort of floats above the the Harkonnen uh, industrial complex uh, uh, to, on his way to see the Baron. Um, the night before that was to be shot, um, Lynch and uh, the assistant director and a couple of other people went to inspect the cable car set. Um, just to check it over because they were shooting the next morning and it had been like nobody had been really looking at what had been done and it was pathetic the controls were basically a you know a sheet of plywood with a, a dowel sticking out of it. It, it you know it was just so basic and whatever and that was the one time I saw in Lynch actually get angry on set he kind of blew up about that that it, it was just un, you know it was unfilmable it was and the next morning when the the scene was ready to be shot uh all the controls had been built and it, and it, and it looked like something <laughs> so somebody had worked overnight to to fix that but that was the one time i saw him get angry I'm also curious to know if you saw some of the collaboration between Lynch and special effects legend Carlo Rambaldi, who also worked on Alien and E.T. Rambaldi was on set um, when they were shooting in the back lot for uh, uh, when Paul has to, uh, you know, jump on the sandworm. And that was all, you know, there was a full full scale mock-up of a couple of worm segments on a rail and uh, so so Rambaldi was there uh fixing that because when when Paul pulls the uh, the flesh of the worm open uh there's all this sort of uh stringy tendons and stuff inside you know the idea is that then sand gets in there and irritates it and the worm rolls and and uh, you know Paul sort of rides up as it rolls in the sand and uh you know there were a lot of condoms used in that which of course is classic Uh, special effects technique so all these all these ligaments and uh, things were uh, were made out of condoms and then slathered with uh, ky jelly or something to make it glisten and uh, slimy but that's actually the only time i really remember rambaldi being on set 
But I remember seeing a behind the scenes clip of Rambaldi and Lynch together working on the Guild Navigator and Lynch sketching or pointing out changes to Rambaldi. That I think would have been uh, during pre-production because as far as I remember, you know, my memory is, again, this was a long time ago. As far as I remember, the, uh, the scene with the Navigator was actually shot fairly early in the production. So the Navigator would have been built you know, quite a, quite a while before that. Let me put it this way. If you saw the production as an arc, when did you notice things started to go wrong? Don't, I don't know that, that it was obvious that things were going... As I said, very early, I, I, I had this sense that because of the way Lynch was pacing it, there were going to be issues in terms of length and so on. And then uh, later on, we heard about these guys coming down to cut pages out of the script. But once... Once the process was going, everything was getting shot. Lynch was was really focused and uh, uh, really engaged in what was going on. So I don't know whether internally in him there came a point where he thought this is not going to work out for me or whatever. But right to the end, um, you know, everybody was was putting their you know like total effort into what they were doing. But I mean, then again, you know, there were there were things where sequences were being shot, and then later they they'd have to be reshot because the script had been re had been revised. The whole thing with Paul um, drinking the water of life and having his vision was actually shot twice in two completely different ways. And the first one was part of the whole that whole mid section of the you know life in the, the Fremen culture, which I mentioned, that eventually got cut out. And I think they simplified it and sort of compressed it. So now you get that one where he goes out into the desert and as he's having his vision, all the worms rise up and surround him and so on. But originally it was it was done inside the the siege, you know, the, the caves that the Fremen live in. And there, you know, there was a whole sequence where they... Uh, he extracted uh, the water of life, which is the way you get that uh, that drug, which the uh, the priestesses get their psychic uh, abilities from. Is uh, you take a baby worm and you drown it in water because you know water is uh, uh, completely deadly to the worms, and it essentially vomits out this liquid, which is what you then drink, and it and it. Uh, gives you those visions all of that was shot and it, you know it's just beautifully designed and uh, you know very very atmospheric and uh, uh, but you know it all got cut out yeah. it because because a, a lot of that the, the, what the Fremen culture was like and what it, its roots, it, its religious beliefs and its ceremonies and so on it just took too much time when you tried to get it down to a two hour film. And so all of that was just, you know, very quickly compressed into that scene where Paul just drinks. You don't know what the water of life is when he drinks it. He's just given this bottle of something and he drinks it and then he has his vision and the worms and, and it, it all, it all takes place in a couple of minutes instead of, you know, this much more elaborate sequence where, you know, there's so much more detail and texture. And... Well, then was Lynch the one who did the script revisions and was he involved in the shooting of these scenes? I think he was he was always involved in in those revisions, and he did re and yeah he did the shooting. The, the, I, I don't think they ever brought anybody else in to uh, to uh, sort of uh, you know patch something together. I think he he did everything. But I think with those kind of things, that would have been part of his growing disappointment and disillusionment with the process of you know working on a film like that. That. The, the things that he had put effort into and that, that sort of meant something to him when he was writing the script and so on were just being uh, discarded basically for commercial reasons. And, and, and it's still actually a mystery to me why uh, Dino De Laurentiis would ever have thought of hiring David Lynch to make his big science fiction movie. Well, I've heard that it was Dino's daughter, Raffaella, who was a fan of the Elephant Man, and she had cried to the Elephant Man and had this idea that Dune would be this film with strong feelings, and she ended up producing the film. In your mind, how could Dune be saved? I don't know if you've ever read the original script. I mean, I, when I read the script, I, I actually really enjoyed it. But as you're reading it, you're thinking, wow, this 
this is like a really long film. The, the script was, I think, about 225 pages or something, but it's, it's very dense, uh, which is the way, you know, Lynch writes, because, uh, you know, he thinks in terms of the images and so on. It needed to be a very long film in order for all the elements to work and breathe. And, of course, Universal was contracted to get a 135-minute uh, cut because, you know, you have to get so many screenings in a day. It doesn't matter what the film is, make it the right length. And, uh, and you could tell very early in the production that Lynch was pacing things on the set very slowly. So what was already a long script, you could tell, was going to be a longer and longer movie. Like Just the way the actors were delivering dialogue was at this very deliberate pace. And, and uh, eventually Universal sent um, some people down who started sort of cutting things out of the script. Okay, we're not going to shoot this, we're not going to shoot this, we're not going to shoot this. And behind their backs, Lynch would be writing new scenes to put in and shoot. So it was it was this weird battle, and I, I, I you know, not to psychologize too much, but I, I almost got the sense that there was this sort of passive aggressive thing, where Lynch, being you know this creative artist used to working entirely on his own terms, was doing things. Uh, to undermine the the corporate interests that were involved in the film, but of course the result of that was his first cut was four or five hours long, and uh, it eventually got cut down to 135 minutes, which essentially gutted the script. I mean, I'm I'm very fond of the movie partly because I was there when it was shot, of course, um, but I I think. In many ways, it's a, you know it's just magnificent as a piece of creative filmmaking. The you know the the sort of world building that goes on in it, but narratively, it's very crippled. And and I know that a lot of material was shot which could have made that better, but only if you'd allowed him to make you know say a three-hour film. A three-hour film would have would have kept a lot of the uh, the strengths of the original script. You know, when they did the uh, special television edition, Lynch didn't want to be involved anymore. He, he, he had had such a bad experience making the film. They got some hack editors to, uh, to expand the film so it became a, like a three-hour TV thing. And they put back certain things, but they put them back very badly. Yeah, there's this long introduction where they try to explain everything, and they use um, production art and and sort of clips out of context to to essentially tell the story in ten minutes before you see the film. I don't get it. Is is that a collage of storyboards put in the film to make sense of the backstory? Well, yeah, storyboards and some of uh, like Ron Miller's paintings and I guess Tony Masters' sketches, and uh, yeah, it was, it was just a complete mishmash of stuff. But um, I mean, for for me, the the worst thing that happened when it was cut down was almost the entire midsection was removed, which was Paul learning about the Fremen and their life, how they survive in the desert their culture, and so on. So it becomes, rather than this huge story about ecology and the formation of religions in response to uh, you know, the harshness of the environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's about you know, a couple of warring noble families. It's, you know, it's the Atreides against the Harkonnens. It's made much more conventional because of that. The bit that bugged me the most in the long TV version was they restored uh, the fight when Paul first, uh, Paul and Jessica first meet the Fremen, and Paul is challenged by one of the Fremen, and they have a knife fight. And so the people who were making the longer version put back in the fight, but they took out the point, which is after Paul kills the the character. Um, 
he weeps because he's never killed anybody before. And it's like this huge emotional thing for him. And all the Fremen see him like giving, as they put it, giving water to the dead, which is like unheard of. You don't waste your water by crying. Dead. And that is what makes them start to see him as something different and something special, which eventually leads to him becoming their leader. Do you have any last thing you want to add? Any favorite memory from your time on the Dune set? I think my, my best moment was uh, in Mexico when Jack Nance came down to uh, to join the cast. And, you know, he had the little little sort of supporting role as one of the Baron's minions. And I, I gave him a like a photocopy of my uh, my original uh, typescript. And he phoned me up in the evening, and uh, he was almost in tears. Uh, he said, you know, we put in all those years of work, and it was so hard. It was such an effort. And we were doing all these crazy things, and we always said to each other, nobody's ever going to know. And then along comes this guy from Canada, and now people will know. And that, to me, was validation of what I had done that uh, Jack Nance was moved by my article. Ja, det var allt för den här gången. Mitt namn är Henrik Möller. Musiken är gjord av testbild. Hej då!